Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the house of the Lord. Welcome to Orange Coast Community Church. We would like to, at this point in time, ask you to stand with us. We're going to go to our Heavenly Father, and we're going to address whose home it is that we're in today. And I just want to let you know, I don't know if you can feel it, but the Master Physician is in the house. Praise God, praise God. Oh, God's children said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Bless your holy, holy name. Amen. Amen. Indescribable, 
rolls up the sleeves and just putting on the rinse. Our God is an awesome God. There's thunder and his footsteps and lightning and his fist. Our God is an awesome God. The Lord wasn't joking when he kissed him out of Eden. It wasn't for no reason that he shed his blood. His return is very close, so you better be believing. Our God is an awesome God. God and, and this is one of the ways in which we can thank him by giving back to his work financially and there you have an opportunity to uh, text in your giving you could do that uh, on your cell phone and then afterwards turn that cell phone off and then you could also give by uh, placing money in the back box or the box that's in the fellowship hall as well and then you have on the screen another opportunity that we're going to give you for Sandy and Pastor David you could text to give with your mount and the word Sandy. Sandy. This is to help support for any costs that have uh, they've ensued when it comes to the time spent there in the hospital and some of the loss of income that has come through her inability to work. There's also a white box in the fellowship hall for cash or for checks that will be available for the next two weeks. So for this Sunday and next Sunday, you'll be able to give to support them. So many people, dozens, not perhaps hundreds of people, have been praying for Sandy. And Pastor Dave and I were the ones to walk in on Thursday and witness the miracle.
share just real quick with Pastor Rick about it. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man 
and of birds and four-footed animals and of crawling creatures. <laughs> Amen. Pastor. Last Lord's Day, we took a look at the miracle of the gospel and its power to change the lives of people, the great evidence of God's love. Today, we'll examine why people reject his love. And I hope you take good notes and perhaps even watch the message again online because what I'll be sharing with you are transferable concepts, insights, information that you can share with people who are skeptical and doubting the reality of the existence of God. Let's bow together. Thank you, Father, for the book of Romans. Thank you how you're beginning to teach us about the depths of the gospel and why we desperately need your love. And starting today and going on for the next six weeks, we're going to be seeing the state of humanity. Humanity in the raw, very clearly spelled out. And when it's seen, we wonder sometimes how in the world you could love folks like us. We make foolish mistakes, we say stupid things, and yet in your amazing compassion, you reach out to us. Help us to enjoy this passage as we learn some insights about who you are. Be convicted at, at the necessary points but also to accumulate the information that we need so we can effectively share the gospel with those outside of this church, outside of Christ. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Erwin Amen. Lutzer writes, imagine your brain being connected to the internet so you could sit on a park bench and mentally surf for any information you wanted. Far-fetched? Well, you might be surprised to discover how far artificial intelligence, AI, has progressed in 2024. Artificial intelligence is humans whose natural born abilities have been augmented by superhuman intelligence and machinery. In the years to come, predicts Ray Kurzweil, founder of Northern California's Singularity University, we will connect our neocortex the part of the brain where we do our thinking to the cloud. Over the next decade, our species will start to find our spiritual experiences through interconnections with each other, giving rise to a global consciousness that we perceive as our brand new divine. Our need for an external God who sits in heaven and judges us will eventually diminish and disappear. We will no longer talk about a God who created us, but rather about the God that we created. Wow. Man's arrogance and God-given intelligence has been tweaked, has been twisted, to such a pathetic point that he will eliminate his need for God in the next 10 to 20 years if Christ does not reappear, and he will. Due to that, mankind will stand... is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. That verse is the key that unlocks the...
It is not politically correct, but it is... No, that's him everywhere. Acts chapter 5, the church is growing, it's moving, it's expanding. And two people, Ananias and Sapphira, come into a church service and lie about the amount of loot they give the Lord and they drop dead in front of everyone in church. Cell phone's off, thank you, thank you. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we have believers who are dropping dead during a communion service for not honoring God the way he should be honored. Last night in our Saturday night service, we, we talked about two experiences where God in his wrath has stepped in. One of them that you recall of that Turkish ambassador that rose up not long ago and began railing against Israel and began railing for those who tortured them and he fell dead right there in the meeting. God's not beyond stepping in and revealing his wrath. He does that occasionally. But on a regular basis, his wrath comes out in more subtle forms as we'll be seeing today. Note the word reveal. His wrath is revealed from heaven. It's the Greek word apocalypto from which we get the word apocalypse, the name of the last book of the Bible. Calupto is to cover in the Greek, and apo means to take off. So it's to take off the covers. It's to unveil and reveal. And it's interesting because in the original language, it's in the present tense. And as we've mentioned many times in the past, in the Greek, the present tense is always present. So the Bible says God is always revealing his wrath. Don't forget Psalm 711. God is a righteous judge who has anger with the ungodly every single day. He's a loving God, but his love is tempered by his holiness and his necessary wrath. This is the teaching of the scripture. Now, why is it revealed? It's revealed against ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Let's unpack those thoughts. Ungodliness, a disrespect for the person of God. Unrighteousness, a disrespect for the perfection of God. A disrespect for his person and for his perfection. Here's how it works. Man says, I don't want to love you. So I'm disregarding his person. I don't want to live for you. I disregard his perfection because I choose to worship artificial intelligence. Now, the thematic verse serves as the outline for where we're going to be going. Today, it's a disregard for God's person. In the next few times together in Romans, a disregard for God's perfection as we delve into the, some of the sins of humanity. Now, man has a plethora of evidence a mountain of evidence for the fact that God definitely exists. He has the answers to all decisions, all dilemmas, all discouragements of life. The problem is, man says to God, don't bother me. Don't bug me. I don't want anything to do with you. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven 
against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who do what? Suppress the truth in unrighteousness. It means they hold down hard evidence. I have seen this talking to people in a car I was driving. I've seen this talking to a person in a coffee shop. I have seen this out in the surf in between waves when I talk to people about God and the response is, don't tell me about God. I don't want to hear about him. I'm not interested in the evidence of his existence. And I think many of you as Christians, if you're opening up and giving the gospel, will go through that exact same experience. It's man suppressing God. Now that's our first thought, and our first thought is that God in his care still reaches out. God continually reveals the truth. Let's say that together. God continually reveals the truth. How does he reveal the truth to humanity? First, through what is sensed. Through what is sensed. Look at verse 19. Because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. The creator has stamped upon everyone's conscience the reality of his existence. Turn over a page to chapter 2, verses 14 to 16. When the Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these not having the law are a law to themselves, in that they show the work of the law written where? Internally in their hearts. Their conscience bearing witness and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. And verse 16 says, a day of judgment will arrive when that will be dealt with. So man instinctively, naturally, in his conscience is aware of who God is. He has placed this in the heart of every human being. They know there's a master designer who's created all that we see in the universe. Scientific anthropology tells us that every culture on the planet Earth has a system of worship. This bothered Charles Darwin and ran cross-grained to his theory of evolution. So he was very happy when he came back to England and reported that I found on the island of Terra del Fuego a group of savages who have absolutely no concept of worship whatsoever. So a missionary left England, went to the island, learned the language, began sharing the gospel, and discovered the savages did have an advanced system of worship, and Darwin missed it. Everyone worships something or someone. And that is an evidence of the existence of God. Our desire to worship something greater than us proves in our hearts that he is here. Now, they don't always call it God. They have their nicknames. Fate, karma, destiny, lady luck. But God, in his sense of humor, has created it so that man cannot even rip off a decent oath without using his name. By nature... I'm going to do this. Fate, damn you. No, that doesn't work. To give power, you got to put the name of God in there. Man, even in his cussing, could not escape the reality of God's existence. That's right. You can clap for that because he does exist. You recall Helen Keller? Born blind and deaf. This young girl had no capacity to communicate with the outside world. She had no ability to be aware of the existence of God until godly Ann Sullivan enters her life. And through months of painstaking effort, Ann starts to communicate with Helen. And one of the first things she shared is that God loves you and he sent his son to die for your sins. And this was Helen's response. Anne, I've always known about him. I just didn't know his name. 
180 years ago, there was a young boy from Africa that they named Sammy Morris, who grew up in a tribe in the heart of Africa that was completely unaware of the gospel, the teachings of scripture, the Bible of the church. He didn't even know that a place named America existed. But as a young boy, he became a stowaway on a ship. And that ship happened to come to America. He landed in Ellis Island. He began learning some of the basics of the English language. And a couple of Christians approached Sammy and told him the story of God's love and how he sent his son. And here's what Sammy said. I've always known that there was a God. And I've known that I'm not a good person and that I need someone to save me. They said, Sammy, how did you know that? He said, it's always been in my heart. This is the answer for those of you who are listening to me today and for your friends who toss out the question, what about the people in so-and-so land who've never heard the gospel? They know the gospel inside. They suppress the gospel inside. And that's why Paul says in this passage, they are without excuse. God continually reveals the truth through what is sensed. And secondly, let her be through what is seen. Take a look at verse 20. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what's been made so that they are without excuse. The divine design is seen in three areas. Number one, in basic nature. In basic nature. In what has been made. That's the Greek word poiemo, from which we get the word poem. So God's creation that surrounds us is like a beautiful epic poem where every part, every line, every verse fits together in a wonderful way. It's seen in nature. You don't have to be brilliant to realize there's a God. You can see this in a bird's wings, in the gills of a fish, in a butterfly bursting out of a cocoon from a caterpillar, or even the bombardier beetle, <laughs> producing chemicals that mix perfectly to explode in the face of his enemy, but never exploding prematurely to take his life. He is an antithetical thought to evolution. He could have never evolved because if he made a mistake and the explosion occurred prematurely, no more bombardier beetle. The evolutionists don't know what to do with him. Or the microscopic mites who occupy only one ear of the moth. If they occupied both ears, the moth could not fly and the moth would die. Again, God drops these hints to reveal to us he is alive and he does exist. So his truth is seen in basic nature, number two, in the body of man. In the body of man. Dr. John Medina, who was a genetic engineer at the University of Washington, gave a lecture at Multnomah Bible College in Portland describing your body and mine. Listen to this. The average human heart pumps over 1,000 gallons a day, over 55 million gallons in your lifetime. That's enough to fill 13 super tankers. It never sleeps, pumping 2.5 billion times in a lifetime. Your lungs contain 1,000 miles of capillaries. Catch this. The process of exchanging oxygen for carbon dioxide is so complicated that it's more difficult to exchange those two than it would be for a man shot out of a cannon to carve the Lord's Prayer on the head of a pin as he passes by. Wow! And then the greatest evidence... The greatest evidence in your body and mind that they've discovered in the last decades is DNA. That's the kicker. DNA contains about 2,000 genes per chromosome. 1.8 meters of DNA are folded into every cell nucleus. A nucleus is six microns long. 
Now this is like putting, watch this, 30 miles of fishing line into a cherry pit. And it's not just stuffed in there. It's perfectly folded. Folded one way, the cell becomes a skin cell. Folded a second way, it becomes a liver cell. To write out the information in just one cell would take 300 volumes, each volume 500 pages thick. And that's by accident? Your human body contains enough DNA that if it were stretched out end to end, it would circle the sun 260 times. What more evidence could God give? But he has more. <laughs> we have basic nature. We have the body of man. And then number three, the brilliantly designed planet. British cosmologist Edward Harrison writes, here is the cosmological proof that God exists. The fine tuning of our universe. To have a planet like ours where life exists, you have to be in the perfect galaxy. There are three types of galaxies, elliptical, spiral, and irregular. You must be in a spiral galaxy like we are in. It's the only kind that produces the right heavy elements and the right radiation levels. But you can't live just anywhere in the galaxy. If you're too close to the center, there's way too much radiation and there's a black hole that you might want to avoid. If you're too far from the center, you won't have the right heavy elements, you lack the oxygen and carbon you need and you will die. So you must live in what's called the Goldilocks zone. And that's where we live. It's the inhabitable zone of the galaxy. Take our sun. Our sun is the class G star that has supported stable planet life as it orbits in the right location for a long time. The star must be in its middle age so its luminosity is stabilized. So many perimeters that have to be just right, just perfect for a planet like ours to even survive. The distance from the sun, the rotation rate, the amount of water, the tilt of the planet, the right size so gravity lets gases like methane escape and gases like oxygen remain so we could breathe. Then you need a moon like ours. It's rare to have one large moon to stabilize the Earth's tilt. And we happen to have one. And it's also nice, he writes, to have a planet like Jupiter to act as a vacuum cleaner, attracting potentially dangerous comets that could strike our planet. Haven't you ever wondered when you hear about the comets and asteroids, how come we seldom get hit because of Jupiter? Because God put Jupiter in the sky to protect this planet. How many conditions have to be met to create a planet like Earth where life could survive? Dr. Hugh Ross said 322. So if it's a probability calculation, there is a 10 to the negative 304 chance that there is a planet like ours with people on it anywhere in the vast universe. We may be the only ones in the whole universe that exist. And God created everything so that you could enjoy it when you go to the desert of the mountains and see the vastness of the sky that he made just for you. He's an amazing God, amen? amen? We live on a designer label planet. God continually reveals the truth through what is sensed, through what is seen, but tragically, number two, 
man conspires to reject the truth. Notice verse 21. Even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. They became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Mark the word speculations. It's the Greek word dialogizomai. Say that with me. Dialogizomai, from which we get the word dialogue. Dialogue. Instead of listening to his conscience, evidence within, verse 19, instead of looking to creation, evidence without, verse 20, man goes inwardly and comes up with conspiracy theories that justify the fact that God does not exist. And Paul is going to explain that to us in the next few moments. How does man attempt to silence the existence of a sovereign God? Why does man choose to worship, as many do today, artificial intelligence? Well, man does it, first of all, through philosophy. He comes up with a crazy concoction, a conspiracy theory. How about all began? It is not founded on the scientific facts I just gave you in the last seven minutes. It's founded on philosophy. Take the words of Stephen Gould, the famous paleontologist. We are today, he writes, because one odd group of fishes had a peculiar fin anatomy that could transform into legs for terrestrial creatures. Because the earth never froze entirely during the ice age, and because a small and tenuous species arising in Africa a quarter of a million years ago had managed by hook or crook to survive, that's why we're here. We long for a greater answer, he says, none exists. I call that fool philosophy. Verse 22, professing to be wise, they became what? You say, well, pastor, I don't like the title of your sermon, The Mindset of a Moron. I find that offensive. Talk to Paul about that because I pulled that title out of that verse. The Greek word for fool is morino. What word do we get for morino? Moron. Christine and I were supposed to go to Israel, and three days before, Hamas came in and began the war. And so we went to see our friends that we were going to go to Israel with, Jim and Melody Shelton. They live in Texas. Now, Jim gave us a tour of the Massa Space Center. For about 30 years, he worked with IBM right across the street from NASA, helping to develop and to direct space shuttle travel. And it was fascinating what we learned. But the funnest thing that I learned is when we stepped in to one of the gift shops and I saw a t-shirt and emblazoned on the front of the shirt were these words. Life on Earth is made up of protons, neutrons, electrons, and morons. <laughs> and Paul would be quick to agree in this passage. The philosophy of naturalistic evolution is utter foolishness. It's been refuted again and again and again. And the person who buys into it is acting brain dead. Rebecca Dranham writes, tourists ask me some very strange questions as we travel among the Hawaiian islands on my charter boat. Some people have wanted to know does the water go all the way around the island? <laughs> Another one asked, how much further till we're actually in the ocean? But the question that made me want to jump overboard was this one. Can you please take the boat closer to the sunset? <laughs> That's what God is doing from heaven. Psalm 2 says he laughs at the man who rejects his existence. 
Here's the principle, let's say it together. Man is a moron without his majestic maker. That's a biblical statement. A biblical statement. For watch this, and this is where we're going now over the next weeks to come. This is what explains what's happening in America in 2024. It's almost as if God had transported Paul from the first century into the 21st century to give us prophetic insight of what's happening in a world that's aflame with immorality and desperately needs the coming of Christ. When man rejects the revelation of God, he eliminates the need for a master designer. And the moment the master designer is gone, the next thing to go is morality. This is why we have atheists today who are directing decisions and telling people, steal whatever you want because there's no morality anymore. And they're being told in these stores, let the person take it, it's okay. No maker, no morality. One year before the famous Scopes monkey trial, which introduced evolution into our schools, Clarence Darrow successfully defended the university students, two of them, against the capital crime of killing a young boy just for the intellectual experience of it. And Darrow won the case with these words. Is there any blame attached to young boys who took Nietzsche's philosophy seriously and fashioned it into their lives? Your Honor, it's hardly fair to hang two boys for a philosophy they were taught at the university. I know of someone who loved Friedrich Nietzsche. His name was Adolf Hitler. He fashioned the Third Reich on Nietzsche's philosophy. And he made the statement, nature is cruel, therefore we can be cruel. I love what the Russian Christian novelist Dostoevsky said. If God is dead, everything is justifiable. You want to rape a woman in broad daylight? Go for it. You want to steal a car? Go for it. There's no morality. Morality comes from a maker. Eliminate him, you eliminate decency in society. Man rejects God's revelation. Man receives God's wrath. You see that in verse 18? The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven. Case in point. 70 years of communism in the Soviet Union. My mind is bothered and boggled by the fact that we have people in America today who are pushing communism upon this country. They know it doesn't work. Just look to Russia. 70 years of hell being encouraged and pushed by Joseph Stalin. During the days of Stalin, kindergarten teachers would tell children in their classes, close your eyes and pray to God for a bag of candy. And candy would not come. Now children, close your eyes and pray to Joseph Stalin for candy. And as they did, Bags of candy would be placed on the children's desks. And the teachers would see, see, it's a waste of time to pray to a God who doesn't exist. You should always look to your leader. Oh, and what a leader he was. 
during the days of Stalin's regime, he was executing 3,800 people every other day in his godless purges. These were not his enemies. These were his own Russian people. He did it through execution and forced starvation and imprisonment. Hey, what's the great result of this atheistic, communistic philosophy? How does it flesh out after seven decades? Listen carefully. Today, because of disease, alcoholism, and a collapsing economy, Russian men have a life expectancy of 59. The birth rate has fallen off so precipitously that Russia's population may sink back to the level of 1917. 70% of Russian marriages end in a divorce. And the average Russian woman has had four abortions. This is life with a leader like this that says God does not exist. So man conspires to reject the truth through philosophy and then secondly, through idolatry. He exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man, birds, four-footed creatures, and crawling creatures. Melvin Demi writes, it's so rare to be offered a meal on the airplane today. I was surprised to hear the flight attendant asking the man sitting in front of me, would you like dinner? He said, what are my choices? The attendant said, yes or no. <laughs> That's man's choice. Someone just got it in the back, very good. Man has a simple choice. He could worship the creator or he could worship creatures made in the creator of his image. And sadly, so many have opted for the second option. The Greek scholar Vincent remarks, deities of human form prevailed in ancient Greece. Those of bestial form prevailed in Egypt. And both methods of worship were practiced in Rome. It was from Greek, or Egypt, excuse me, that Israel received its calf worship. Did you know that in India, Hindus have 330 million gods? It averages out to about eight gods a family. They revere cows and countless other animals that they consider to be sacred. A two-inch long discolored tooth claimed to have belonged to Buddha and was uh, retrieved from his funeral pyre in 543 BC, is venerated today by millions of Buddhists. The tooth is set in a golden lotus blossom, surrounded with rubies, enshrined in the temple, the temple of the tooth in Sri Lanka. He said, what about your numbskulls worshiping animals? Careful. You dog lovers today. I love dogs, but something has happened in America in the last 20 or 30 years. Listen, I grew up with dogs. In the 50s and 60s, you buy a dog and you toss them in the backyard and you let them have fun. Today, every other person is attached to a leash. And that's fine. But I have to struggle with the people who put outfits on these dogs and push them around in shopping carts. If that's not worshiping an animal, nothing is. We're no different than those that we laugh at. And then we have the ever popular worship of the planet. It's become something that drives America. If you read any kind of secular magazines, you will always find something along those lines. Over the last 10 years in Surfer magazines, I, I look at the pictures, I read certain articles, but they're pushing 
pushing, pushing. This ecological nonsense that doesn't fit. One spiritual leader made the statement, the number one problem in the world today is climate change. That's the number one problem? <laughs> it's not terrorism. It's not your sinful nature. It's not the evil that permeates America. No, it's climate change. We're being fed a lie. Dr. Ian Plimmer, emeritus professor of earth scientists at the University of Melbourne, and professor of mining geology at the University of Adelaide explains, the theory of human-induced global warming is not science. Because research is based on a preordained condition and massive bodies of evidence are ignored. The analytical procedure is now treated as evidence. And let's not forget, he writes, climate science is sustained by government research money. This is not science. This is governmental lies given to people in this country and all the countries of the world so that people could bow and worship planet Earth. And I've heard talking heads say for some time, and perhaps you have as well if you're listening, we need to start eliminating certain portions of the planet when it comes to people so that the earth can survive. Because the planet is more important than the people that God created in his own image. You see how man loses his mind when he pushes aside a maker? And he loses his morality and common sense. And then there are other forms of worship that we engage in. We worship the planet. We worship pro athletes. Now, granted, these guys and girls are very talented. But it's sinful the amount of money we give them. It's absolutely berserk and bizarre. But we worship them. Worship pop musicians. Christine and I were going through a department store a number of months ago, and it seemed like everywhere I turned a quarter, when it came to the children's and the youth department, there was another poster of Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift. This isn't Taylor's fault. It's the fault of the people trying to get the children to worship the new goddess that is popular in America today. We worship pro athletes. We worship pop musicians. And, of course, for years, we've worshipped popular movie stars. When the silent screen star Rudolph Valentino died at the age of 30 in 1926, a New York woman took a pistol and shot herself. An English actress poisoned herself. And two Japanese ladies leaped into a volcano to kill themselves. They never met Valentino. They just saw him from afar on the golden screen. And some of you around my age remember a fellow named James Dean. Speeding in a sports car, he dies, and it sparks another round of fan suicide. How tragic that people don't think. People are drawn to worship anything. They are drawn to worship anyone except the only one that matters. We sang of his glory today, amen? Verse 25, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. They worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. I saw a projected image of Time magazine dated 19, or excuse me, 2045. And here's what the headline is going to be according to what they've written today. The year man becomes immortal. Transhumanism, merger of man and machine. And it states, one, man will not die. Two, man will become a god. 
ladies and gentlemen, it's back to the same noxious, nefarious lie hoisted upon humanity by the evil one in Eden. What did he say? The first thing out of the devil's mouth, you won't die, you will be like God. Nothing has changed in thousands of years. Get a little bit of originality, Satan. But he doesn't need to because he's dealing with morons. The dump, the dump, who will believe any nonsense even if it's the same nonsense that got us into all the trouble we're in today. This is an amazing passage of Scripture. Throughout its penetrating section, people are pushing, pushing God aside through philosophy and through idolatry, pretending he doesn't exist. But 2 Peter chapter 3 says that God's not willing that any should perish. He wants all to come to repentance. So in his grace and his love, he keeps shouting out to humanity, here I am. Open your heart. Open your eyes. You'll see me. I'm right here. A lady named Cheryl went to a salon to have her nails manicured. The magician began to work, and they got into some conversations about many subjects. Eventually, they touched on the topic of God. The magician said to Cheryl, who has MS, I don't believe that God exists. And Cheryl asked, how could you say that? Well, just go out to the street. Tell me, how does God exist? There's abandoned children. If God existed, there wouldn't be suffering. There wouldn't be pain. I can't imagine a loving God allowing this. Cheryl thought for a moment. She didn't respond because she didn't want to create an argument. She just paid and left. When she stepped onto the street, she saw a woman with long, stringy, filthy hair. Cheryl turned and went back into the beauty shop and said to the beautician, you know something? Beauticians don't exist. (laughs) What do you mean, she said. I just did your nails. I'm right here. No, no, no. Beauticians don't exist. If they did, there wouldn't be a woman with long, unkempt, dirty hair like her outside. And the beautician replied, Beauticians do exist. The problem is people don't come To me, Cheryl said exactly. (laughs) Let's bow together. Have you come to the magnificent God? You say, Pastor, I'm a Christian. That's that's true. But it may be like the people in this passage. You've kind of edged them out. You pushed them out of a particular area of your life. You don't want them to interfere. It's the area that you want to control. And it's highly possible that he's speaking to you today about that. He's speaking to you through your conscience, through creation, and through the conviction of his holy word. But right now, you've got your own agenda. You've made up your own mind. Would you open your heart? Would you give yourself fully to him today? Right now, in the quietness of this moment, tell him, I'm going to start doing it your way and not mine. If you've never come to Christ, if you've never acknowledged the fact 
that you have sinned and fallen short of God's perfection. And you need a savior. This would be the perfect moment for you to act on that. I could pray a very simple prayer along with you that could usher you right into the kingdom of God. In a prayer, you acknowledge the fact that you need him and you want to release your whole heart and future into his hands. It's a prayer that changed my life 55 years ago and could change yours today. But I have to have your permission to do it and so if it's your desire today to pray that prayer with me, then would you take your right hand and hold it good and high, and I'd love to pray for you right now. God bless you, sweetheart. God bless you. In your heart, echo the words that I'm about to share verbally. Dear Father in heaven, I'm not a perfect person. But that's why you sent your perfect son. He died on a cross to forgive all my failures. I accept his gift of love to me today. I believe that he rose from the grave to prove that he is God. And I love you, Father. And starting today, it's my desire to live for you. Thank you for making me a member of your forever family. It's so wonderful to know that when I die, I'll be taken directly to heaven to enjoy you throughout all eternity. Thank you for the new life that has begun in my heart today. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Two weeks from today is Resurrection Sunday. We're going to have a great breakfast. And uh, Chuck will be collecting money. If you raise your hand there, Chuck, to kind of contribute to the breakfast. The men are putting it together. It will be outstanding. So you can give that to him this week or next week. A few days before Easter Sunday, we also have... Um, Good Friday service in which the elders are going to be speaking of the topic of the evil people of the passion. And so you're going to want to be here on Good Friday at 6 p.m. 6 p.m. Okay, we'll invite our team up at this time. Thank you, Pastor Rick. That message will go down in the archives of history. Thank you. Orange Coast history was just made, I believe. Thank you. Thank you. Remember this week to not only praise God because he's the master physician and he woke Sandy up, but also to, to keep her in prayer so that she can continue and continue to get healthier and healthier day by day. And um, pray for Jim Segovia and Irene's family as well because they're mourning the loss of Irene. She's in glory this morning. Great in my